Mr. Janadas Devan, Director of IPS, Excellencies and Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, I'm very happy to join you this e afternoon at this year's Singapore Perspectives Conference. In fact, I think this is the first time in quite a long while where I have come to a gathering of this size. Uh, not quite like what it was pre-COVID, but it comes pretty close. Uh, especially with new safe distancing measures, with an antigen test, I think slowly, gradually, we can uh, make our, our way back to a new normal. Uh, the theme of the conference is aptly titled Reset. There is still great uncertainty about how the virus will reshape our society in the coming years. But there is no doubt that COVID is the most serious crisis the world has faced in a long time. The virus has already changed our world and we have to be prepared for more changes to come. And I think it's useful to think of these changes over different time frames. For this year, and maybe a good part of next year, we must be prepared to continue living in an acutely changed world, meaning the rules around wearing of masks, upholding of safe distancing measures, and avoiding crowded places. These will continue to be part of everyday life. Beyond that, the availability of COVID-19 vaccinations will progressively restart global travel. But getting the world vaccinated won't be quick or easy. It will take time for vaccines to be manufactured and distributed, and even longer before the world gradually builds up immunity. In Singapore, we plan to have all our residents here vaccinated by the third quarter of the year if all goes well. But there is still a lot of uncertainty over the duration of protection following vaccination and whether vaccinated individuals can transmit the virus. Early data from some countries like Israel suggest promising results with the vaccine, but we will still need time to look at all of these critical unknowns and to resolve them. And we may well encounter some bumps along the way. For example, the current vaccines may not be so effective against new mutant strains of the virus. Indeed, there has been initial research suggesting, for example, that the South African variant can evade the defences that vaccines build in our body's immune system. The pharmaceutical companies are confident that they can respond to this threat, but that means adapting the vaccine, getting regulatory approval, and ramping up manufacturing all over again. In the positive scenario, this means the vaccine becomes a bit like an annual flu jab. We need to keep on getting one, perhaps on a regular basis. Or perhaps we develop a vaccine that works for all strains. But in the worst case, we end up always a step behind the evolving virus, and we will not be able to catch up in time. So there are still tremendous uncertainties ahead of us. And the bottom line is that we live in a shared world, and no one is safe until everyone is safe. Of course, no pandemic goes on forever. At some point in time, the pandemic will pass, but it may take four to five years before we finally see the end of the pandemic and the start of a post-COVID normal. What will this new post-COVID world look like? No one can tell. Some positive change will certainly arise. You know, one can recall that spittoons and public spitting were widespread in the beginning of the 20th century. But after the 1918 influenza pandemic, they were rightly seen as unsanitary. And the practices stopped in the West and eventually all over the world. In Singapore, COVID-19 has prompted greater awareness of hygiene habits and social responsibility. We have become more self-conscious about washing and sanitizing our hands. And I certainly hope we will continue the habit of wearing masks if we are not feeling well in, in this post-COVID world. On the other hand, some habits may well die hard. 
For example, some people think that we might stop shaking hands altogether. I read an interview where Anthony Fauci said that post-pandemic America will involve compulsive hand washing and the end of hand shaking. I have tremendous respect for Mr. Fauci, but I'm not sure, I, I fully agree with the compulsive handshaking. I'm not sure that we will see the end of handshaking. Because this call for alternative forms of greeting has happened before in previous pandemics too. You can trace back through history. Each time there is a pandemic, there is a call to say, let's have different forms of, of, of uh, greeting in order to reduce the risk of transmission. It happened in Singapore too after SARS, but somehow, Humans being what we are, we have always gravitated back towards some form of human contact. Will this change after COVID-19? We will only know after time, over time. In a crisis like this, the natural tendency is to extrapolate the worst from our immediate circumstances. For example, some predict that digital technologies will accelerate the move towards less dense living and working arrangements and render cities obsolete. Now, it's clear that digital trends will stick and will remain with us. But predictions about the decline of cities, I think, are premature. Throughout history, pandemics have not dampened the waves of urbanization, nor the flourishing of innovation taking place in cities everywhere. When the bubonic plague hit the city-state Florence in the 14th century, it was ravaged and many fled. By some estimates, more than half the population died. But then, Florence bounced back and launched the Renaissance, a period of great flourishing, learning and discovery. When the yellow fever pandemic hit Philadelphia in 1793, Thomas Jefferson said, this will, quote, discourage the growth of great cities in our nation. Well, look what happened after that. And after the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, we saw the roaring 20s and the boom in major cities like Chicago and New York City. So if history is a guide, it has shown that cities can bounce back from catastrophe and emerge stronger than before. And the reason this happens is that cities are not just buildings and monuments. They are fundamentally about the people who dwell in them. And humans are by nature social animals. We are naturally drawn to participation, collaboration, and social interactions. We are also adaptable and capable of adjusting to new situations. And we must never underestimate this human capacity for innovation and learning. So we have the ability to shape what our future looks like. And as suggested by the team of this conference, Let's think of the crisis as setting the stage for a software update, a reboot of sorts, after the tremendous damage inflicted by the virus. Beyond the immediate task of up protecting lives and livelihoods, I'd like to highlight three resets that we must make in our policy thinking, our lifestyles and mindsets, even as we tide over the immediate season. First, we must reset our social compact to emerge as a fairer and more equal society. The pandemic may be indiscriminate about who it infects, but its impact is anything but equal. It has, in fact, widened the gulf between the haves and the have nots Globally, we see poorer segments of society paying a heavier price, be it in terms of economic impact or access to health care. And that's why governments all over the world have had to spend huge sums to help their people cope. In Singapore, it's always been at the top of the government's agenda to reduce inequality and to ensure a meritocratic system that works for the good of all. We recognize that markets are incredibly powerful. They inject dynamism, they transform societies, and give people from all backgrounds a chance to better their lives. But free markets have their flaws. It creates anxieties and stresses about technological change and foreign competition. And we see a continued stretching out of incomes and wealth. 
So we need a combination of open markets and effective state intervention to level the playing field at the starting point, provide support and buffers for every citizen to help them bounce back from setbacks, and to equip them to excel in an uncertain environment of global competition and technological change. We started this journey more than a decade ago, where we tilted social policies actively in favour of the lower-income group, for example, through workfare and through a whole range of support programmes in education, housing and healthcare, and more recently by providing more retirement assurance through the Silver Support Scheme. Income inequality in Singapore, as measured by the Gini coefficient, has in fact been trending downward. Last year, we rolled out a significant package of emergency measures, and we are luckier than most countries in that we do not have to borrow to fund these measures. We are able to draw on our reserves to save jobs and tide over Singaporeans who are hardest hit. These temporary measures will have to be tapered down this year as the economy improves and to ensure our finances remain sustainable. But the impact of the pandemic has created added impetus to strengthen our social support system. So there will be a permanent shift towards further strengthening of our social safety nets in Singapore to protect the disadvantaged and vulnerable. And we will have to work out how this can be done in a sustainable manner over the long term. The bottom line is that we aim to give Singaporeans more assurance and support in a more uncertain and volatile post-COVID world. Beyond tackling inequality, we must keep our society fluid and mobile. Meritocracy in Singapore must not ossify into a hereditary system where the condition of your birth determines the outcome of your life. How do we achieve this? We start by intervening early and uplifting our children from birth. And that's a key focus and priority for me in the Ministry of Education. And that's why we are making significant investments in preschool. We want to make sure you don't need expensive private enrichment classes. Instead, all can benefit from quality programs in MOE kindergartens and across our anchor and partner operators where fees are kept affordable and regulated. We are now looking at the earliest years of childhood, even at the prenatal stage, where the well-being of a pregnant mother can have lasting effects on a child's development. So early intervention is effective and we are going all out to do more on this front. We are continuing this strong support in schools. Since joining the ministry, I've made it a point to visit schools with a higher proportion of students from lower income and disadvantaged family backgrounds. Some of our most committed and dedicated principals and teachers serve in these schools. We are giving them more resources, so they are able to provide additional support for their students. For example, learning support in smaller pull-out classes and beyond academic support, exposure to a whole range of different activities and programs so that it's not just about improving their academic results but also nurturing soft skills, for example, through public speaking, through learning journeys, through overseas trips. And we are also deploying more allied educators, counsellors and welfare officers to support students especially those with special needs. We want to ensure that we continue to uplift these students and help them achieve their full potential. We are also making fundamental shifts in our model of education. We don't want to front-load learning when someone is young, but we ought to treat education as a conveyor belt for the job market. Instead, we want to have a system of education for life, which is what we are doing through our national movement, Skills Future. We want to have multiple entry points across the age distribution and across the entire skills spectrum, and thereby enable everyone to reskill, upgrade, and continuously improve to be the best possible version of themselves. Besides intervention in education, 
a broader mindset change is required. Societies everywhere today place too much of a premium on cognitive abilities and do not value sufficiently those engaging in other forms of work. As a result, merit has become narrowly defined by academic and cognitive abilities. But in fact, there is a wide range of abilities and aptitudes needed for societies to thrive. We need the craft skills of artisans and technicians, the creativity and imagination of artists, and the human touch of those doing care jobs. And the pandemic has thrown a spotlight on this imbalance. We've come to better appreciate the contributions of our essential workers who help to keep our lives going. Our allied health workers, contractors, security guards, F&B operators, transport workers, just to name a few. We must honour them for their work and accord them the dignity and respect they deserve. We must ensure they receive fair remuneration for the important work they do. And that's why we are pushing our, on moves across different jobs uh, through our progressive wage model. And we are also reviewing our ITE and polytechnic pathways to ensure graduates from these institutions get better jobs with higher pay, good career progression, and a strong foundation for lifelong learning. If we attach more value in terms of prestige and income to people who excel across a wide range of fields, and not just cognitively, incomes will naturally spread out more evenly across society, and we will go a long way in advancing our cause towards a fairer and more equal society. Second, new habits from the pandemic show us that we can and we must push for a greener Singapore. When human activity came to a standstill this year, carbon emissions around the world dropped significantly. In fact, satellites high above our planet detected the reduction of pollution. The natural world began to heal. So as economic activities begin to pick up, we have to figure out a way forward. We cannot go back to the status quo ante. Aside from dealing with the continuous threats of pandemic, climate change will be the existential emergency of our time. So we must build a greener economy and society that's more environmentally sustainable. And this idea of sustainability is not new to Singapore. We are already one of the greenest cities in the world. We are the only country in the world to freeze the growth of our, of our vehicle population. We are one of the few countries to have closed its water loop and to reuse every last drop of water. But we must go further and build on what we have done to achieve greener growth and greener mindsets. And so we are deploying more renewable energy like solar power. We are exploring regional power grids and investing in new capabilities like hydrogen and carbon capture utilization and storage. We are transforming our industries to be more sustainable and investing in R&D in new energy and resource efficient technologies. Beyond that, we have other ambitious plans. We are going to phase out vehicles with internal combustion engines and have all vehicles run on cleaner energy. We are making sustainable living a key feature of all HDB towns, where we incorporate features to reduce energy consumption, recycle rainwater, and cool our towns. We will significantly cut greenhouse gas emissions and seek to achieve net zero emissions as soon as we can. Sustainability can also be a new source of competitive advantage and open up new opportunities for growth and job creation. There is potential for Singapore to be a carbon trading and services hub in Asia, for example, in areas like sustainability consultancy, verification, carbon credits trading, and risk management. We can also be a leading center for green finance in the region and globally. The greatest promise of going green, however, is not about what it will mean for us today. It's about building for the future for our children and the next generation. We must embark on a sustainability movement so that we can leave Singapore in a better shape for our future generations 
just as previous generations have done for us. Finally, one silver lining in COVID-19 is that it can present an opportunity for us to strengthen our sense of social solidarity. Throughout history, we've seen societies rise and fall. What is it that enables some society to thrive while others to go into decline? It's a big question, but one of our founding leaders, Mr. S. Rajaratnam, used to ponder over this and he would refer to the ideas of 14th century Islamic philosopher and historian Ibn Khaldun. Khaldun wrote about the concept of asabiya. It's an Arabic word that describes the bond that exists in a community. And in his view, it's this sense of community and solidarity that explains the rise and decline of society. When a community starts out, everyone is prepared for austerity and discipline together. People are prepared to make sacrifices for the common good and society prospers. But as life becomes more comfortable, this sense of solidarity is weakened. People lose their social anchors and seek to advance their own individual interests. And when that sense of community and common purpose is eroded, things start to fall apart. In fact, before we were struck by COVID-19, there were already powerful forces chipping away at social cohesion both here and in countries everywhere. Even today, in the midst of this pandemic, there are significant minorities around the world who think that COVID-19 is a hoax and does not really exist. This is a pandemic where 100 million people in the world have been infected, more than 2 million have died. And when you do global surveys, we're not talking 1-2%, we're talking significant percentage who think it's a hoax. And this is the great irony. We are living in an age where everyone can access information so readily. People can access raw, instant, unfiltered information from multiple sources. But unfortunately, salacious falsehoods and conspiracy theories tend to gain circulation over facts. And so the irony is, despite the overwhelming ease of access of information, we are living, as some would say, in a golden age of ignorance. We are also seeing the downgrading of expertise, because experts are seen as out-of-touch elites, and expert knowledge is sometimes portrayed negatively as a conspiracy by the elites to perpetuate their dominance. And with easy access to information, everyone can claim to be an expert. Just look at how many armchair epidemiologists have emerged during this crisis. Virtually everyone thinks they can say something intelligent about how the virus spreads. Nothing wrong with that. And in fact, it leads to more skepticism and questioning of expert advice, which is in a way healthy because you, you know, experts don't always get it right, and you do need to have some level of questioning. But when you disregard expertise altogether, I think that's when trouble starts. Or, for that matter, when there is a tendency to view expert advice from the narrow prism of our own social and political tribes, we end up self-selecting information to support and reinforce our own points of view. The economists call this confirmation bias. And there, it just reinforces certain views without allowing us to see things from another perspective. As a result, it's very hard to find consensus. You see in many places a hollowing out of the center as extreme views gain ground, and it makes societies very hard to govern. The pandemic has indeed intensified these divisions in many countries. And it may get worse in some of these places. At the same time, going through a crisis like this can also lead to renewed strength. Because we are forced to reflect on our own values, we develop a more acute sense of shared memories and common destiny, we go through difficulties together, and we forge a stronger sense of group solidarity and social cohesion. 
So which path will apply to Singapore? How will the pandemic change us? I am confident that we will prevail and emerge stronger from this crucible. And I do not say this lightly. I speak from my own conviction of seeing the best of Singaporeans over the past year in the face of adversity and very tough conditions. I've seen frontline workers, both in the public and private sectors, giving their all, working round the clock through the past year. I've seen many ground-up initiatives, people stepping out of their comfort zones to look out for the vulnerable and to help those in need. And I've seen the resilient attitude that Singaporeans have shown, affirming the values we have nurtured since the founding of our nation. This renewed sense of solidarity is critical as we recover, and it will enable us to build a better society together. And that's why the government is intentionally creating more opportunities for our citizens and stakeholders to be part of the decision-making process, including in policy and implementation. Through the emerging stronger conversations, we are bringing together Singaporeans to share their hopes for a post-COVID society and to discuss how we can partner them to get there. We are also strengthening our engagements with young people on the SG Youth Action Plan, starting with their vision of Singapore in 2025. And we are convening more alliances for action, action-oriented coalitions with a mix of government, community, and business stakeholders to solve our problems and co-create solutions together. And we hope all of this will pave the way for much higher levels of participation in shaping our future Singapore together. So in conclusion, we've just crossed the one-year mark in our fight against COVID-19. As we have said before, this fight is far from over. There are still many, many uncertainties ahead of us. But even as we focus on the immediate battle at hand, we must look ahead to the task of resetting for the future. And my hope is for Singapore to emerge as a fairer, greener, and more equal country with a much stronger spirit of solidarity and shared purpose. We all know the hard truth from this crisis. Singapore remains a perpetually vulnerable country. We are ultimately a tiny little red dot. Many things can go wrong for which we have no control over. For example, we cheer that we have managed to procure vaccines for everyone in Singapore. Anything can go wrong with the vaccine supply. It can be a disruption in the manufacturing plant for which we have no control over. It can be a disruption in supply chains for which we have no control over. So many things can go wrong. But the crisis has also shown that we are not without our own resources and resolve. We have the nimbleness, the ingenuity, and the gumption to solve our problems and move forward. And most of all, we have seen that as one united people, we can achieve exceptional things together. So that's how, as one united people, we can realize our aspirations and ideals and build a better Singapore together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Now, before we begin our question and answer session, a quick reminder for our physical audience, please leave your mask on as you ask your questions. Raise your hands, our mic runners will come to you, but leave your mask on. Now, without further ado, let us begin our question and answer session. Gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for allowing me to join this conversation at the closing session of the IPS Perspectives. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you, and I just wanted to also congratulate the organizers for really making a virtue out of necessity and organizing these series of virtual conversations, which has enabled us to have a really good diversity of views and perspectives over the last few weeks, and which um, I think we will want to come to in the discussion. And uh, thank you, Minister, for that very thoughtful and um, thought-provoking speech, which was interesting and also inspiring in its its broad political and philosophical sweep. 
I think you've managed to touch on quite a few of the issues that came up over the last few weeks. Issues of diversity and identity, issues of uh, inequality and social mobility, and um, discussions about politics, leadership, and solidarity, all of which I think we'll want to come to in, in the Q&A. But I think I'll, I'll try to steer the discussion in those broad areas, the, the pandemic, uh, education, and politics. But let's start with the pandemic. Um, I think that's really what is on most people's minds. And if I take a step back over some of the developments over the last few weeks, uh, in the interview you gave with your co-chair, uh, Minister Gan Kim Yong, you spoke a bit about having to manage the public mood swings over the course of the last difficult year that we, we all lived through. Um, you know, initially, I think we, we all hoped that we would get on top of the situation fairly quickly and emerge stronger. It didn't quite pan out that way. And then you, you mentioned the, the sense of uh, impatience to sort of hunker down and, and get on top of the situation, which kind of swung the other way a few months later to the sense of impatience that we weren't opening up fast enough. And then now, of course, with the latest measures, um, a little bit of gnashing of teeth about the tightening up for, for the Chinese New Year period. And I think it also struck me that you also said you felt a sense of deja vu at some of the questions that the, the journalists were asking you last week. Um, and because we have, we have made progress you know, with the vaccine, with um, testing, with uh, ramping up our healthcare facilities, but there are also challenges, as you mentioned at the end of your speech, uh, the delivery of the vac vaccines could go, could get delayed, there could be new variants. So in a way, we are back to where we were um, last March or April. So some people are wondering, is 2021 going to be a rerun of 2020? I don't think many people want to watch that movie again. Or is it going to be a sequel? Uh, minor variations in the plot, but pretty much like what it was. Or are we thinking of a remaking of the movie or something quite different with new narratives and new plots and new players? Uh, that brings me to my question, which is related to this idea of reset. You know, IPS has made reset the focus of its uh, conference. The Straits Times made reset the focus of its conference. The World Economic Forum is making reset the topic of its conference. But I'm not so sure we, all, we are all talking about the same thing. Because reset could mean, if you ask an IT professional, and every time something goes wrong with your computer, he says, press the reset button, and you kind of go back to where you were without any change. Reset in a bilateral context could mean having a fresh start, leaving the past behind. But it could also mean something quite fundamental. And I think you, you alluded to that in your speech, some major changes in the way we think, changes in paradigms. So I just want to start by asking you, when you think about reset, what is it you have really in your mind, and what do you think that we as a society most need? Thanks for the question, Warren. First of all, um, I do get a sense of deja vu sometimes watching where we are today and comparing with what happened last year. Journalists are asking me similar questions. And when you see the community cases you know, creeping up these few days, you sort of, your, thought, your mind goes back to the situation we were in uh, at this time last year. But there are important differences, and we should recognize these differences. We are in a far better and stronger position today. Our testing capabilities are much higher than they used to be. Our tracing capabilities are much better. So we can test and trace and ring fence clusters much better than we could ever before. More importantly, vaccines are on their way. And that's a game changer. No, no doubt there is uncertainty with supply, but we have done our best to procure as much as we can. And if all goes well, we get everyone vaccinated. So what we need to do really is to tie through from now until the point when Everyone in Singapore is vaccinated, maybe at the third quarter of the year, perhaps at the end of the year. There is a solution. Now, so I think we have better tools to fight COVID-19. That should give us confidence, and that should help us to uh, focus our minds. Yes, there may be some sacrifices that are still needed from time to time. We still will need restrictions 
but let's get through this stretch, get everyone vaccinated, and we should be in a much better situation after that. Now, on the topic of reset, um, my view is that the COVID-19 doesn't so much introduce new disruptions as it does accelerate existing trends. So the, the main force of COVID-19 is not so much to introduce something completely new, but it really accelerates in a very significant way trends which we have already observed. Trends like the use of technology. We've been talking about hybrid workplaces for years. We've been talking about co virtual conferences for a long time, but within a short period of time, bang, everyone takes it up. Right? So it's an acceleration of trend. Um, for that matter, even geopolitical tensions that you see everywhere, um, that we see between the major powers, it's not a new issue, but again, it's been sharpened and accelerated through this pandemic. Inequality, it's not something that we are only dealing with today, but again, the pandemic has sharpened, accelerated the trend of inequalities because you see the impact of the uh, pandemic impacting different groups differently and having a disproportionate impact on the poor, the vulnerable, and the disadvantaged. So it's with this in mind that we prepare our sequel, if you will. Right? It's a sequel where we already know what the big forces around us are, but we must recognize that the forces are coming now with double, triple the force that we had anticipated before, and therefore it behooves us to fundamentally re-examine all our operating assumptions, our paradigms, and think about how we can better prepare our society for this new world. Thank you. Let me just take up that idea of um, old habits dying hard, which you, you spoke about, you know, and giving up handshakes, and the progress we've made with digitalization uh, over the past year, and also the work from home, which has really helped with um, the progress in, in flexible work arrangements. I think as many of us in this room, as employers, as, as, as leaders, and as well as uh, members of uh, businesses, we are having to grapple with how do we persuade workers to return to the offices because they are very comfortable working from home. And I don't think we want to go back to the old way where of presentism, you know, of bums on seats and managing that way. So how do we make sure we get the best out of this year-long painful experience that we've had, and at the same time, not lose something in terms of that human connection and collaboration that you mentioned? Well, I think every company will find its own balance. Clearly, the new normal will be some form of a hybrid arrangement. It will not be 100% work from home. I don't think that's doable. Nor is it, as many of you would have experienced, um, you, you cannot function effectively without that human collaboration and that social interaction. So you do need a chance for people to come together. But do you really need to go back to where things were, where you know, sometimes you don't need to be in the office and yet you still insist on being in the office? I don't think so. So companies, employers need to take on a mindset where they embrace more flexible work arrangements there will be more hybrid arrangements, a blend of face-to-face -face as well as uh, remote working. I think these new possibilities will emerge after COVID-19. And I'm quite sure uh, companies everywhere, employers everywhere are starting to think about how to find this new balance. I'm quite sure many of you who are managers or employers would start thinking very hard about how to find this new balance in the new COVID-19 world. If you are not, please start doing so. Uh, this is one of the things that we will have to grapple with uh, going forward. You, you talked about cities and you know, how those will always be centers of collaboration and innovation and people will want to gravitate to cities. So I, I share your view that it's not the end of cities, but you could push the question and say, which cities? Because if people are used to working from home or working from anywhere, um, companies, international corporations could work directly with talent in Mumbai or Vietnam. Why will they need to be here? Which has obvious implications you know, for your previous portfolio in terms of office space and rents and also for talent. And uh, suddenly our angst over foreign talent might, might sort itself out. 
Now, I'd just like to ask you about that issue. I mean, it has major implications for us in terms of a hub and a uh, global hub. Well, it, it does. And I think that implication has precipitated some concern that will Singapore's role as a hub in the future become less relevant. And I can appreciate those concerns. But I would also put the point the other way, which is that precisely, and even in this new normal, you will still need some physical presence. We are not going into a world where it's all just machines and we stop having face-to-face -face interactions. That's not going to happen. It has not happened across human history. It's unlikely to happen going forward because, as I said, humans are fundamentally social animals. So physical presence will still be relevant. And if you ask people, international investors, the broader international community, if you have to have some presence in Asia, where would you like to be? Well, I would like Singapore to be first on that list. And I think if we are able to respond well through COVID, position Singapore in a stronger position, then indeed we can be more relevant as a hub, not less relevant. And when people think about having some presence in Asia, Singapore ought to be the first answer that comes to mind. And so I have many questions of my own, but I'm going to take a question from, from the audience, which relates to this idea of, of cities and opening up. And this is a question from, that's most immediately from Hui Min, but it has 12 votes, one of the top, which says, with the risk of importing COVID-19 infection due to the surge in cases around the world, what is Singapore's strategy to try to balance the risk from imported cases versus sustaining trade and the economy? I, I understand the concerns about imported cases, and um, when you see the daily statistics, very often you see quite a number of cases that are not in the community, but these are what we call imported cases. I should explain that we have not increased our um, travellers coming into Singapore. It's not because there are more travel, travellers coming to Singapore. The large volume of the people coming into Singapore remain construction workers. They are coming to do jobs for us because the contractors need workers, and a good number of them have left Singapore, so they need to replace uh, the people who have left with new workers. And number two, they are foreign domestic help who are doing caregiving work for Singaporeans. Those are the two largest sources of travellers coming to Singapore. And the daily numbers have not increased. They have been about the same in recent time. Why have the numbers gone up? It's simply because the prevalence rate, the incidence rate of the disease is much higher now. The virus is raging in countries everywhere. We require them to serve a pre or to administer, be administered with a pre-departure test 72 hours before they come in in order to screen off those who are already infected. But the nature of this, these sorts of tests is that it's not foolproof because you could be incubating the virus. You take the test, you're negative, but later on you may very well turn positive. And that's why we have taken all the precautions necessary to make sure that when these travellers come into Singapore, we put them on a stay-home notice requirement up to 14 days, sometimes even now extended to 21 days for certain countries, but we keep them in quarantine so that we isolate them from the community. And those are precautions that we have been taking all along and we will continue to take to ensure that even as we have a continued flow of people coming in, which is needed for Singapore's economy and society to function, we do all that is necessary to take the necessary precautions and safeguards and isolate these cases from seeping through our community. Are there questions from the floor? Because it'd be nice to have a sort of interactive discussion. I see a gentleman's hand at the back there, table three. A mic's coming to you. Yes. Hi, good afternoon, Minister Wong and Warren Fernandez. Um, my name is Winston Ng and from Millennia Institute. 
I asked a question earlier during the first panel, the business panel, but I was recommended to direct this question to Minister Wong directly. As a young student entrepreneur, I always question the state of business or commerce stream in Singaporean schools. In today's education landscape, junior colleges only offer two streams, the arts or the sciences. However, there was a time in the past where business subjects were offered alongside these subjects. Today, business subjects are only found at Millennia Institute. The Polytechnics offer such business courses, but a percentage of people such as myself are interested in a multidisciplinary learning such as the arts and business or even the sciences and business. I believe that the common stream in the education landscape is vital for the growth of a new generation of entrepreneurs in Singapore. And the skills learned with business subjects are extremely relevant in today's work landscape. For me, learning business subjects actually allowed me to kickstart my love for business and entrepreneurship. And now, I have my own startup working with various NMCs and SMEs and government agencies. In my honest opinion, exposure to business and entrepreneurship from an early stage can actually benefit many young Singaporeans, such as myself, who may be interested in starting up their own businesses. Even if one does not wish to start their own businesses, the skills learned in business subjects, such as human resource, finance, and operations, are extremely vital in today's work environment, which would better prepare students for the working world. Minister Wong, in light of the reset team today, Will there ever be a chance where business subjects are offered alongside the traditional arts and sciences to a wider degree of schools in Singapore? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Winston, for the question. I, the, I will, the education Singapore landscape in Singapore is always evolving, so I would say it's something we will always consider what's the best mix of subjects to be offered across all our institutions. In the past, you are absolutely right, JC students could take commerce, but over time, a lot of the commerce subjects have um, been offered by the polytechnics, where they offer HR, finance, accounting, and so students who are interested in more applied subjects now go to the polytechnics, where these are applied subjects geared towards the job market, whereas the JC curriculum has evolved to one that is uh, you know, providing more fundamental knowledge, arts, science, humanities, and not so much in the applied sense. What is the right balance? Should we now reintroduce some applied subjects into the junior college? Uh, it's something that is always on our minds, and so we will continue to review and consider what's the best format, what's the best balance between uh, subjects that are offered in the junior college versus those at the polytechnic. But I would make a second point, which is very often we think about education you know, that needs to be front-loaded within this uh, first 20 years of one's life. What's the best combination? But really, Really, that, that it's not possible to teach and learn everything within that short period of time. Right? So we, we really need to think about learning from a lifetime perspective and consider the different modes in which you can acquire new knowledge throughout one's life. Right? So a JC student that need, doesn't have exposure to business can always do so later. Likewise, a student like yourself or someone in the polytechnic that has exposure to business may acquire another form of knowledge which you did not have the chance to do so during your time in Millennia Institute or the Polytechnic. Right? Because it's not possible to front load and cram everything within the short duration of time. So if we take that perspective that really it's not just what I can do within two years, but what we can do over a lifetime, I think many, many possibilities open up and we can continue to think about different ways of acquiring new knowledge. Minister, could I follow up on that question um, to relate it to what you were saying in your speech about shifting the focus and the emphasis away from just 
cognitive in skills and intelligence to other skills and intelligence which you are trying to encourage and in that way recognize other uh, essential skills that in a society and also rebalance and, and address the question of inequality in that, in that way. Education, therefore, being the great leveller. And I was quite struck that you said in your speech that you were visiting schools uh, from less well-off uh, neighbourhoods and trying to make sure they had the resources and um, the ability to, 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 de to help people uh, from those backgrounds. Now, because you are the new education minister, it would be interesting to hear you, in your own words how you are framing your sense of priorities for the education system. And if I go back in time, I mean, your predecessors, uh, S.M. Taman, uh, framed it simply as teach less and learn more. Um, Sir Heng Sui Kiet had the idea of every school being a good school, talking about quality as well as inequality. And your immediate predecessor, uh, Sir Ong, talked about lifelong learning and skills future, all of which you are building on. But in your mind, how would you crystallize your priorities as education minister? Well, I'm only six months into MOE, <laughs> so I would be a little careful about talking about my priorities. And perhaps also, I have a, uh, you know, I, I'm wary about, you know, talking about what I want to do because when my mother, who's been a teacher for many, many years, used to come back from teaching and then she would lament, oh, we have a new minister and he's got this new slogan for the schools. <laughs> Oh, we've got a new pump sack, and he's got this new program in mind. <laughs> and, and, and I can understand, you know, it's, things keep changing, and they don't feel like they are part of um, the solution, but it's something hoisted on them. So, my own, coming from my background and growing up the way I did, I, I hesitate a bit to say this is my priority. I think it should be what educators want. And all educators want to uplift every child and ensure that they are able to achieve their full potential. And that's what we will want to do too, together with our educators in every school, make sure that we uplift every child. I'll, I'll be sure to ask you the same question in a year from now, so long as you don't have a sense of deja vu. Uh, but related to that question on, on education is this one which is very uh, getting a lot of traction about how the, the pandemic has sort of awakened a sense uh, in Singapore about uh, wanting to deal with the inequalities in our society and, and addressing the needs of the less well-off, as well as the foreign workers in our community. Uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts about how we might grapple with inequalities both within our community as well as with others who come to work here. Well, so as I said just now, um, let me just look at the question. The, I, it's, this issue of inequality is something that it's not something new that has come up. It's something that has been on our minds for quite a while within our Singapore community, we have done quite a number of moves. I highlighted some of those in my speech. And we will continue to review and examine what we can do to strengthen our social safety nets. Uh, taking care of those that are disadvantaged, those that are vulnerable, those that are unemployed, what additional assurances and supports we can provide. And then looking at mobility as well, ensuring that children from disadvantaged homes, from lower income groups can get the best chance to thrive and do well. Beyond that, I think the issue is about what can we do for our migrant workers too, and indeed, we must do more. I think the pandemic has shown that all of us uh, can do more to respect the dignity uh, of our migrant workers, appreciate and value them for the many, many contributions that they give to our society. And this is something the government can do better, it's something that society can do better too. I, I recall when we had to decant some of our migrant workers from the dormitories to new living arrangements in order to reduce the density of the dormitories. And we had to set up uh, these uh, temporary dorms in some of our neighborhoods. It's not such an easy thing to do. Uh, a lot of reaction from the public. And 
I, I can understand why, but I hope through this pandemic and through a reflection on what has happened, we, we can all start to change our mindsets, start, start to appreciate better the contributions of our migrant workers. And that the government is doing its part because we've talked about building new dormitories, reducing the density of the existing ones, putting in place new uh, norms in these dormitories. And we will need to build many more of them. And we hope Singaporeans will also start changing the mindset and embracing um, migrant workers as being part of our community. And should there be a dormitory built near to where you live, Let's, let's, let's not have this NIMBY synd uh, syndrome anymore. Let's, let's understand that they too are part of our community and we should embrace them. Minister, a, a good follow-up question which was trending as, as, even as you were speaking is this one by Nicholas. How can we encourage employers to raise salaries, to add value and raise the status of more jobs? And how can we in turn encourage society to see the value in tradition, traditionally low-paying, low-status jobs? Yeah, it's, it's uh, ongoing. This is not something that can change overnight. I mentioned earlier how societies everywhere now place a high premium on cognitive work and not enough on work or other forms of work. If you think about the spectrum of work, there's head work, there is hands work, technical, hands-on work, there is heart work work that involves the human touch or caring. And I think that balance in many societies have shifted towards a lot of emphasis on hate, but not enough on hands and heart. And we do need to strike a better balance. It means not just incomes, it also means uh, recognizing the contributions of every worker across the entire spectrum and according dignity and respect to the contributions of each worker. Will that happen so easily? I, I, I think it's not so straightforward. It will take time. But again, if there is one reset that can happen after this pandemic, if there's one thing that forces us to think differently, as I alluded to just now, it is that we, I think, all can see for ourselves the, the vast contributions that many of these people in the essential workforce make to our lives and how we should honour them and, and appreciate their contributions. So that, that, that goes to the societal mindset I, and I hope the pandemic will start to shift that. I have hope because when I go to schools and I talk to young students and I see the kinds of things that young students do, they write thank you notes and appreciation letters um, for what has happened and, and they reflect on what has happened and they write these thank you notes and many of them spontaneously, not because I'm around or because the teachers ask them to, many of them write thank you letters to migrant workers and to workers in the essential sectors, frontliners. And, and that gives me hope that, you know, with the next generation, they will have a different mindset about um, the contributions of workers and about recognizing these workers. Now, going beyond that mindset, it's really also about incomes. You, we, we need to have better incomes for these workers. Part of it can be done through government policy, and that's why we are talking about the progressive wage model, rolling it out, getting wages to be higher. But part of it is by the employers themselves, redesigning jobs, um, making the, uh, enabling these workers to be more productive. And that requires some form of industry transformation, which we are trying to facilitate. We have grants and incentives, but we also need employers to come on board. And then thirdly, we are doing everything we can on the training front to upskill the workers and to give them new skills so that they can take on these new jobs, become more productive and uh, contribute more. So it's not just a matter of employers, you know, increasing pay without seeing the additional productivity of the worker but through job redesign, through uh, skills training, the employers can see these workers contributing more, and with that added contribution, they will justify higher pay as well. So these are moves we are making, and we hope we can make significant changes in the coming years. Let's take another question from the audience. Can I see? 
Over there, yes, <laughs> lady waving at us. <laughs> Thank you, um, Minister Wong and Mr. Fernandez. I'm Kalpana from IPS. Um, the question I have is an education-related question. So there are two types of skills that I would argue are the most important, aside perhaps from our spoken language skills. But neither of these skills are currently taught in schools. These are, one, relational skills, so empathy and communication. And you know, this will allow us to better communicate and particularly better hear and listen to one another. And number two, reasoning skills. So here I'm talking about informal logic skills, um, the ability to sift through this pervasive information and content that we now have at our fingertips. These are domain neutral subjects that will serve us both as individuals and also as a community. I am wondering, what are your thoughts on making this available to all students through our schooling? Thank you. It's, it's not so much that we don't, have, uh, we don't teach these subjects. You may not see them as formal subjects in schools, but we are very conscious of the need to develop these competencies. And that's why MOE talks about 21st century competencies. And if you look at the framework for 21st century competencies, they encompass these skill sets that you talk about. Human to human relational skills, soft skills, as well as reasoning skills, logic skills. So our hope, and again, it takes time, but what we would like to see is every teacher, not just being a subject teacher, the teacher's role it's not to say this is the subject I'm teaching, math, science, and my goal is to help every student to excel in that particular subject. But every teacher being a 21cc teacher, 21st century competencies, meaning to say the teacher itself, whatever subject you are teaching, has to be cognizant of the student's abilities with regard to relationships, with regard to reasoning, logic, and then consciously and deliberately foster this and nurture this in the classrooms. Right? So you can do this through a whole, you know, different ways. You can encourage more participation, more group projects. You can, you know, have a whole range of different formats of teaching and learning. The point is, you are not, no longer just teaching to the exam, trying to get the students to do well just for the sake of scoring well on academic results alone. Uh, that's something that we have been talking about for some time. It's not just because I've just come into MOE. We've been talking about this for a while. Um, we have been trying to inculcate this mindset across all our teachers and they embrace it. Right? They, they, fully are on, they are fully on board and they would like to move and shift to this new approach as well. We would need parents to also come on board because it's, you know, the whole learning and education process is not just about what happens within the classroom. But if society, if parents supports what teachers and what schools are doing, I think we can go a long way in shifting away from this emphasis on book knowledge and academics towards more holistic education. Minister, at this point, I'd like to take up the, the concept that you introduced in your speech of Ezebiah. I found it a very powerful one, you know, and I wondered how, how did you come up with this idea? What, what attracted you to it? Why did it resonate with you at this time? And what's the role of education in helping to shape it? Hmm. Well, it's, it's something I read in a book long ago. It's, um, this is a book, I think it's Heng Chi's book. Is Heng Chi here? No. Um, she wrote a book on Rajaratnam with uh, edited interviews and this look way back and I, I read that book many years ago and I remember this concept of Rajaratnam, Mr. Rajaratnam talking about this uh, and sort of when, when COVID-19 struck, I think it resonated again because you know, the pandemic has, I think, forced countries everywhere, societies everywhere to ask ourselves what sort of individual sacrifices should we make for the collective good? There is no doubt we have to make individual sacrifices. We have to curb individual liberties, be it safe distancing rules, you know, lockdown rules, uh, wearing of masks. These are all curbs on individual freedoms. 
But to what extent are we prepared to make these modest, or sometimes not so modest, depending on the extent of the measures, to what extent are we prepared to make these sacrifices for the common good? Uh, that's, a, that's, a question, that's a big question that um, I think societies everywhere have to answer. Not just for COVID-19. COVID-19, I think, brings up this particular issue, but the broader context is we all have to ask ourselves, what is the common good? What is the good life? And are we prepared to make modest sacrifices in order to pursue that collective sense of the good life? Or do we want to be a contentious society where it's anyone to himself and everyone just protects their own selfish benefits? And, and this debate, I think, will happen in societies everywhere uh, following COVID. It already, you already see um, people talking about it. Um, I think in Singapore, we have our own balance, but we always need to remind ourselves that the stronger that sense of shared purpose, common destiny we have as a nation, it's not going to be perfect. Not everyone may agree, but that stronger that consensus, I think the better we will be in charting our way forward. I think SM Taman spoke about social empathy and solidarity. And in the recent uh, inauguration speech by, by President Joe Biden, there was a lot of emphasis also on solidarity and, and unity. And what struck me was he said, you know, in a democracy, um, it's not about uniformity. There is diversity of views. And I think in the course of our discussions over the past week, we've heard about that diversity and increasing complexity in Singapore society. Um, how do you manage that diversity and yet have greater unity? It's a bit of a tension, isn't it? Absolutely. So th it's, it's a big question everywhere, particularly in a more plural society, in a more diverse society, where people may have different goals, aspirations. Your definition of a good life may not be the same as mine. And that's completely understandable. These, it's fine to have differences. But as I said, the more we can build consensus around what that common good is, regardless of our differences, political differences aside, individual differences aside, the more we can build consensus around what that common good is for Singapore, I think that gives us purpose, it gives us that sense of a common destiny for the future, and it will enable Singapore to continue thriving and doing well in the future. So that's that there are no easy answers to this. Uh, societies everywhere will have to grapple with it. I think it is so much more important for Singapore, given our small size, that we maintain that strong sense of consensus and not end up frittering away at cohesion and have uh, individuals or individual groups lobbying only for their own interests and neglecting what is at stake, which all of us have common ground in. Is it becoming harder to do in this age of ignorance that you talked about? <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's becoming harder to do for countries everywhere. But like I said, you know, it's a, if, if there is one silver lining in COVID-19, it is that a crisis like this does force us to reflect more deeply on what our shared values are. What do we want um, from society? What kind of life do we want for ourselves and our children? What is that purpose in our limited duration on this planet? What would we like to achieve? And, and if that reflection in Singapore leads to a coming together of shared values and common purpose, I think we would be able to move forward better, faster, and with a renewed sense of purpose. I think one of the, the themes that seem to have, you know, captured attention during these, these forums over the past few weeks was the idea of ideas that are coming at us through social media. You know, talk about woke culture and cancel culture and privilege. And it's, it's always been the case that ideas come to Singapore and we, we, we deal with them. But how do we respond to them in a contextualized sort of way, knowing our own history and our own culture? And, and, and isn't there a role that as education minister, you see schools playing to help contextualize these ideas which are coming at us at a relentless pace. It's, it's a continued uh, process. 
Uh, everything com comes back to education after a while. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's true, we are all exposed to new ideas online. And nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's good that we get these uh, op access to information is so tremendous in today's world. But as you said, there is always that risk that we um, take in ideas without understanding the context in Singapore being different. Or worse, we buy into conspiracy theories or um, you know, falsehoods that may not be true. And what we have seen overseas is that these um, ideas tend to sharply divide people into different tribes, social tribes, political tribes. And when that happens, as I said, it's, you become very resistant to hearing from the other side. Right? You, you self-select information to reinforce your own blind spots and biases. And, and then it starts to polarize. And that's very worrying. Uh, it's, you see this happening in many places. Can we avoid this happening in Singapore? We, were tr we must try our very best. We must do our, you know, in education, in schools, we, we will continue to focus on cyber wellness, helping students to navigate through the internet. But in the end, it depends on all of us as Singaporeans to decide how best we can navigate this new landscape. I was hoping you'd say you need good media as well. <laughs> but never mind. Is there another question there's, from the there's floor? There's a role for that too. <laughs> yes, please. Dino. Thank you, Nandis. Uh, um, Mr. Lawrence Wong, Zaino here. Um, I was following the forums earlier on. And there was one forum in particular which struck me. This was about the soul of the nation. And what struck me was that during the discussion, hardly was there any mention about the challenges of multiculturalism and diversity. But there was a lot more talk about what would normally come from the millennial, our younger generation, the challenges of the future, so that brings me to this question. I mean, early on, there was a session on social cohesion, and there was talk about cohesion. But even that, it was in the context of social cohesion rather than ethnic cohesion or multiracial cohesion. Um, and earlier on, I think Chris G here did a very wonderful summary of the earlier session when he used the example of a mandala mandala as a design in terms of things of getting in place, and this is what we see in Singapore. So back to the question of soul of the nation, how do you see, not only as Minister for Education, as maybe, if I can say, 4G generation with hopes of taking us to the future, how do you see Singapore, our Singapore, our multiracial, multireligious Singapore, in the context of that mandala, and whether you see multiculturalism and multiracial cohesion as a big issue, and whether we are actually equipped to handle the changes to come in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zainal. It is a big issue. And I would say that our aspirations and ideal for a multiracial, multicultural Singapore must continue, we must strive for that ideal. It's a continued work in progress. Is there still racism in Singapore today? Yes, of course, there is. Let's acknowledge it. But is the situation today better than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago? I would say it is too. I would say most objective, I hope most objective observers would acknowledge that it is better. But is it perfect? No, it's not. So our work aim must be to continue working at this, trying to reduce the imperfections, trying to make it better year after year after year. And that includes us re-examining all the things that we have done with regard to all the different uh, policies we have to bring about a stronger, closer union of people. I mean, there are a whole range of issues that we can talk about, whether it's ethnic integration quotas, whether it's self-help groups, 
none of this should be cast in stone or, or regarded as sacred, cannot be changed, right? But we con constantly review, evolve, look at ways we can uh, achieve a, a better, closer, uh, multiracial, multicultural society. We must avoid, we must do our very best to ensure that identity politics that is divisive and polarizing does never gets a chance to take root in Singapore. I think when that happens, it, it really um, fuels the worst tendencies in, in people. It breeds hostility and divisions, as we have seen in many other places. So let's recognize that this is an issue. It is an issue. Uh, we are continuously working at it and making it better. Minister, we're, we're almost running out of time, but I'd like to bring the discussion back to politics and the politics of the pandemic, so to speak. Um, some people have said you've had a good crisis, being fronting the whole um, effort, mean, in a, a way. A good crisis? In a way, what yes. What does that mean? <laughs> well, let me get to that. I mean, you've had to, your, your co-chair has described you as a decisive leader, and you yourself described how you had to manage um, having to take difficult decisions, um, uh, you know, in the face of ambiguity and uncertainty, and having to sort of sense the public mood and carry the ground with you. Uh, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about how you grappled with having to take those difficult decisions. Was it mostly head or heart or gut? What did you do <laughs> to help you make a decision, you know? You know, and also, more broadly, what did this very difficult year that we all lived through, but you especially, what did you take away um, about the exercise of political leadership? Hmm. Uh, you always save the best questions for last. <laughs> uh, um, I, it's certainly not about deciding by gut. Right? I, I don't trust my own gut. So um, I, I, I have obviously gut reactions to anything that comes up, but in decision making, you know, in a situation like this, it is not just based on instincts. You've got to look at data, you've got to look at evidence, and we have a whole team of people helping us, experts, scientists, advising us. Uh, so we bounce off ideas, we bounce ideas off them very rapidly, constantly almost. We get daily updates each time new developments happen, a new variant that develops. Is there a risk? Is there no risk? Should our measures be updated? It's a constant um, daily affair. It's, I mean, this, this has been my life for the whole of last year and it continues to be possibly for the whole of this year. It's a constant daily affair tracking these developments, uh, getting inputs from a whole range of different people, Sensing, as you said just now, also the public mood, public sentiments, not so much because, not so much that we, um, that public sentiments would shape or Im would, would impact on the policies per se, because the policies first and foremost have to be determined by what's right from a public health point of view. But to some extent, the implementation of the policies do depend on the public acceptance of these measures. And, and that's a judgment. If, if the sense is the public is not prepared to accept the measures, we can talk about having new measures, but if the compliance rate is very low, then it's not going to be effective. So we have to think through a whole gamut of different issues before we develop any new measures. Um, that's the very challenging, almost exhausting part of the work. Uh, but I think it's more than just about me. It's a really a whole team effort behind this. Uh, we have many ministers on the task force, each overseeing different responsibilities. Uh, DPM Heng is the advisor to the task force. He provides us with useful inputs and guidance. SMTO as well. And then we have uh, a, an excellent team of public officials across the entire uh, uh, government, across different ministries and agencies, all working together, and, and we've had to 
sort of ramp up very quickly at the start of the crisis, but by now, the processes are much better. The inter-agency inter coordination work is much more efficient. So it's, um, it's that kind of uh, work that continues, and we, we will have to you know, keep on adjusting, keep on monitoring the situation, never quite sure what, will throw up, what, what new uncertainties will throw up the next day. Right? So this is, this is just part of uh, dealing with a crisis like that. Your, your second part of the question was about... I've forgotten what the second part <laughs> of the question now. <laughs> but, but I really had one more question for you, and we, I, the monitor is saying time's up. But I do want to ask you this question, which was your last rounding up statement about emerging stronger. And I noticed you said that I do not say this lightly. And it's easy to say, but I felt the conviction when you said it. And I wanted to ask you, what makes you so sure? Um, you know, I think having a, going through an experience like this and a crisis like this, is, it's, it's really quite surreal if you think about this. No one would have imagined a year ago that the world would have come to a standstill, travel would be stopped, and we will be where we are today. No one would have imagined. It's, um, when we say it's a crisis of a generation, and at, at that stage, you know, last year, some people said, no, oh, you know, this is scaremongering, you know, everything will pass. By the summer of 2020, things will be over. It's not over yet, and it's not over by a long shot, because we may still have to live with this for a year, two years, three years, who knows? So it, it really, um, I think, puts us in a very different position where we have had to deal with so many difficulties, so many unknowns. But I've been fortunate in having this front row seat at seeing people responding to the crisis face-to-face, -face, at, at, in close proximity. Uh, when, for example, we had so many cases breaking out in the dormitories, and that, in many ways, was our darkest hour last year. More than a thousand a day, we could have easily, easily been overwhelmed by the number of cases. Our hospitals would have been overwhelmed, and if that were to happen, I have no doubt that fatalities would have gone up drastically, significantly. And you know, then you see how, within a very short time, the people came together, the, those who worked on the community care facility, getting the expo ready, getting the Changi Exhibition Center ready. In double quick time, we thought it would be impossible. Uh, we said it would be impossible, but they made the impossible possible public sector, private sector, coming together, working on it. And you know how they say the, sometimes it's just a few people can change the course of history and change the trajectory in the crisis? This was one of those moments where I, I thought the contributions of a few people truly made a difference because they enabled us to care for tens of thousands of workers without overwhelming our health care system and we cared for them and did, them and did the best for them. And the result speaks for themselves. We have had one of the lowest fatality rates in the world, and we have very few fatalities among the migrant worker population as well. We did everything we could to care for them. And it's the result of these few people working together, getting the facilities set up, caring for the workers, and making sure that they are looked after. And I see them from time to time. I, um, they, you know, they are exhausted, they are tired, but they never gave up. They continue to persevere. Last, late last year, when we stood down these facilities, uh, we gave a very small farewell for them and said, thank you for all the contributions. Not farewell, but thank you, right? And because we are standing down, we don't need these facilities anymore. But we said, look, I don't know how things will unfold. Please be prepared. There is a chance that I have to call you back again and activate you. I don't, I really, really don't want to. I will do my darnest not to activate you. But 
should the need arise, please be prepared. And they said, without a moment's hesitation, we are ready. If you need us, we will be back. And, and that's the tremendous spirit I see in this example, but across so many different examples of Singaporeans rallying together, showing tremendous resilience. And that's why I say I don't speak lightly when I believe with conviction that Singapore can emerge stronger from this crisis. Thank you, Minister. Hang on. I think that's a good optimistic note to end. Thank you, Minister, for the very engaging session and for your candor with your answers. I see Janata's ready to take over, so... Thank you, Minister. Um, we have come to the end of this year's SP. It was the strangest Singapore perspectives we have had, the most difficult to organise, as you might guess. Three days was online, nine sessions spread over three days, over two weeks, as it so happens. A few complain of things hanging and freezing, but on the whole, um, it was a success. Uh, we discovered, too, that there were advantages to doing things online. For one, we were able to uh, get a wide cast of distinguished uh, speakers from all over the world. A great many were willing to do it because they didn't have to fly here, so that was an advantage. Today's in situ proceedings, uh, as you might guess, was very difficult to organize, um, um, but I think it is good that we tried. As Minister Wong noted just now, this thing, this new normal, we grandly call it, may actually last for quite a while. Uh, he said four or five years. So <laughs> ideally, I hope you're not right, but uh, who knows? <laughs> um, as you might guess, uh, there are many people who worked very hard uh, put, to put all this together. First of all, I want to thank our sponsors. They are listed on the board. Uh, my colleague, thank, please do thank them. Uh, some of them are very long-time sponsors and, um, and supporters. My colleague Christopher Gee did the heavy lifting, um, organizing this conference, curating the subjects, choosing the speakers, persuading them to take part. And of course, IPS excellent uh, admin staff, all of them. This year, because we had to do so many things, including testing all of you, um, almost the entire IPS tribe of about 70 odd people were corralled into service, uh, registering, ushering, and so on. But I would like to thank in particular a few, um, the, our fundraiser, um, Hansen, who of course you know, did all the, the liaising with our sponsors. Publicity, Kaisin, you may have um, run across her. Uh, Regine, um, who was a tremendous help to Chris, uh, supporting him with dealing with about 52 speakers, that's how many we had, and moderators, um, with nine being overseas speakers. So it's quite, a, uh, quite, a, quite a, um, an operation. Uh, Chai, he was hired um, um, to do our digital stuff, and, um, and he did. I think without him, we would not have done these uh, online sessions. Um, and finally, Sealing and, uh, and Zahida, who uh, you may have seen run around, they did the administration and organized everything else. I want to thank in particular MBS, the Singapore Tourist Promotion Board, as well as MOH. They were all of tremendous help. And I've been asked to thank in particular one officer in STB, uh, Xavier Ku, who was, I'm told, of tremendous help in organizing today's antigen test. So, the system actually works. <laughs> so, um, I finally, um, you know, I want to um, do a bit of advanced publicity. Um, the, the next big conference we are doing in IPS this year, actually, um, will be sometime in June on women. Um, and this will be preceded in May with our next uh, SR Nathan Fellow, Corinna Lim, who will be delivering three lectures also on the subject of empowering of women. So it's the year of the women this year. So do look out for these things. And finally, all of you and the hundreds of tuned in online, thank you for your participation, your presence, and your support. COVID or not, I promise you there will be a Singapore Perspectives 2022. So till then, thank you and good night. <laughs>